Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, the B2B Uncut. We're here with episode six today, which is B2B marketplaces. We're going to talk about, is this the right model for you and how to make it successful? I'm really excited. We have a couple of very, very special guests here today. Um, howdy to everybody joining live. I, I love this live po podcast format because we get to hang out with, with folks uh, as we're talking here. And we welcome participation. So uh, we welcome you adding questions into the conversation. Please add those in the chat. Um, Anna, who is our producer, will be aggregating those and making sure that she's sharing those with me throughout the podcast and I can ask those. So please make sure you ask any questions in the chat. Um, today, uh, now through the housekeeping items, today we are joined by Rodrigo Garcia, who's the Vice President, Chief Technology and Transformation Officer at HeartBase Incorporated. Uh, welcome, Rodrigo. And you, it's a pleasure being here. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we're so happy to have you here. And Yoav Kutner, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder at uh, Oro Inc. Hi, Yoav. Hi, Jari. Great, uh, great to be on another podcast with you. It's been a while. So I know, I know. Yoav and I have been have been doing this a long, long time. I first met Yoav in early 2010 uh, when we were at a a uh, just a, a small company called Magento that grew into a very, very large <laughs> company where Yoav uh, created that technology. He was the CTO and co-founder there. Uh, we worked together and then uh, came here to work together at uh, Oro uh, in early 2012. I can't believe it's been 10 years, Yoav. <laughs> it's, it's been a long time and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, always a pleasure to be interviewed by um, the person that was voted the best looking person in e-commerce so <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my only claim to fame no yeah. it's not it's not is, but it's, the, it, it's the funny it, one that's for sure <laughs> is that 11 years ago i was voted the best looking person in e-commerce uh... <laughs> <laughs> that was a it was a holiday party it was a joke so but it, but it definitely well well received it still there. counts it still counts yeah, but yeah counts. hey I don't, I don't, I still put that out into my LinkedIn and, and all of my, <laughs> all of the awards, right? Yeah. All of my awards, all awards uh, uh, out on LinkedIn. Um, no, but, uh, you know, Yoav and I have had, had the opportunity to work together. Yoav is the creator of the, the Oro platform, Oro Commerce, Oro CRM, and uh, Oro Marketplace, which we're going to be talking about today. Not so much the product, but the idea of marketplaces. Um, Rodrigo, I would love, uh, for you, a lot of folks probably on the call know Yoav. I'd love for you to to share a little bit of maybe your background, um, and and maybe a little bit of the parts based story if you don't mind. Of course, thank you, Jari, and again, thank you and 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 Joe and, and to you all for the opportunity being here today. It's very very exciting to, to have the opportunity to talk to you both. Uh, as far as as far as uh, myself, yeah, well, I've been in the IT industry for I don't want to kind of date myself, but it's a little bit over 20 years. So I've seen uh, a, a lot of the growth around uh, technology and transformation, if you will, that has happened in the technology industry in the world um, for uh, for over 15 years. I was in the consulting industry uh, and I had the pleasure of participating, working with many Fortune uh, 100 companies like uh, GE, Coca-Cola, ADT, Baxter Pharmaceuticals, you know, at some point I said, uh, enough of traveling, enough consulting. So I decided to join the uh, the corporate world. And um, for the past six years, I've been working at uh, Partspace initially as the CTO. And then I moved on to uh, a Chief Transformation Officer. Um, and well, that's, that's, that's a quick intro about myself in terms of Partspace. Partspace, as of today, is the largest uh, Aviation Aerospace Parts Locator Service in the world. Uh, um, we have almost 8,000 companies using our products, our platform every every day. Uh, we have between 25 and 30,000 users uh, on a monthly basis coming in to uh, search for parts, uh, market Intel uh, repair capabilities uh, for their um, for the aviation uh, aerospace industry. Um, 
I mean, we keep the, the community keeps getting uh, uh, bigger and better every day. Just just to give you some sense of, of uh, additional statistics, just in Q3, we added 346 companies to our community. Uh, that equates to over 800 aircraft that require service. Uh, that are coming well, companies that that have aircraft that require maintenance uh, repairs that come into the parts-based platform to search for parts, repair capabilities, uh, market pricing information. Uh, in terms of brand names, I mean, any any big company out there uh, in the aviation aerospace industry, one way or another is connected to parts space. It doesn't matter if it's like a large operator like Iberia, Bombardier on the, on the, um, on the manufacturer side. So it's, it's, it's a huge, huge community. Um, on, a, on an annual basis, we have over 12 million parts being uh, searched and, and quoted for in our platform. So it's, uh, again, those, those are very high level stats in terms of our usage, the size of the community and our, our core business. That's great. I, I really, so thank you for the breadth of the introduction. Now you, Partspace didn't start out as a marketplace, which we talked about this in our, our pre-call. Um, what, what evolved the company into the marketplace model? Because we, we see a lot of this specifically in B2B commerce. Um, a lot of companies are, are considering uh, going into this marketplace model and, and if it's worth it. What drove you all into strategically thinking about you know, building a marketplace? For sure. Thank you, Jari. Yeah, the, 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 another quick fun fact for you is uh, Partspace was born in 1996 as the world's, the world's first internet-driven uh, part locator service, right? So that was, that was, that was way back when. But uh, over time, as the community has grown, uh, we know that at the end of the day, as technology uh, has evolved as well, uh, ultimately, having uh, a full, uh, I guess, integration between uh, what technology allows you to do and, and, and the power of the community, uh, we were going to be in a place where uh, we were going to be able to operate a fully transactional model, right? So uh, at the end of the day, it's, it, all, it, it all started with providing uh, the platform, the digital platform for buyers and sellers to connect identify uh, potential suppliers for other uh, uh, procurement needs, uh, market pricing information, and some of the other capabilities that we offer to our customers. Obviously at the time, the technology was not there, but as it, uh, technology has evolved, uh, it was a natural evolution, if you will, of our company to transform into a fully featured marketplace. Interesting, very cool. Where, where are you headed with that? So like, how far are you planning to take this uh, as, as like through this evolution? Like where, where, where's next for you all? And then I, I wanna catch Yoav up to this conversation because, because Yoav, you, you, you know, we've seen a similar evolution, right? And, and you saw the similar evolution on the B2B e-commerce side. So uh, I wanna tee you up for that, but, but Rodrigo, any other perspective on- For on sure. What for you all. Yeah, no. Um, so the first thing that I would say is, uh, as I mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, so as of now, if we, if, if we look at last year's statistics, we had over a little bit over 12 million parts being searched and quoted for in our platform. Uh, this year, we are on pace to break that record by, I would say, between 12 and 15 percent. Uh, but the reality is that um, and that those are those are just uh, parts being quoted in the platform, right? So when you ask me in terms of the direction that we're taking is right now with the current e-commerce experience that we offer our customers, uh, I would say it's just a fraction, less than 5% of those uh, uh, parts are being sold through part space. So in terms of the direction that we want to go, we want to be in a place in the next three, four years that at the very least, 30, 40% of those uh, 12 million parts are being sold in our marketplace, right? So that's where we wanna go. We know that the reason why I give you these conservative numbers is because we know that for us to integrate uh, all the members of our community into a marketplace, not everybody has, you know, the, the technology sophistication, the budget, the, all the different elements that you need to, to be fully, um, connected into, a into, into the transactional model that Partspace has to offer, but we have 
like uh, uh, hundreds, I would say in the thousands, like uh, mid-sized enterprise customers that can definitely participate in the full transactional model. But there's going to be an adoption process. There are investments that they have to do. There's some transformation that they need to go through in order to fully participate. But that's kind of, that's, that's where the vision is. It's great. It's great. I really appreciate that that perspective and, and really helpful to a lot of folks, I think, considering, you know, what they do and why. Yoav, I want to go back to you in this because you're the other side of this coin. You were, a, you know, a vendor on the B2B e-commerce side that you and the engineering team made a strategic decision to really get into the marketplace um, uh, to, to build a B2B marketplace. And I'm, I'm curious what drove you into that, um, you know, opportunity and decision. Yeah, so um, what, with Aura, when we designed it, we actually were trying to fill the void and actually build the product for uh, B2B companies that are trying to sell online or digitize uh, their uh, sales operations. And really, we, we kind of looked at what's the use cases uh, in the B2B space that needed to be solved that were underserved by the existing platforms at the time. Uh, and that's what we kind of focused on. And for us, these models included... Uh, of course, what we call uh, buyer-sell interaction, where you can start uh, any kind of interaction between a potential buyer and a seller and a sales team and interacting in a digital format. Um, but other use cases that we kind of uh, solved for out of the box with our platform and kind of design our platform for were what we call uh, franchise model, reseller model, distributor model. Um, and we started seeing and creating a lot of these kind of features into our application. Uh, of course, we also did stuff that was more advanced. So we had all kind of permutations around the B2B kind of uh, use case. So B2B2B, B2B2C, B2B B2 all the kind of uh, things that we really solved for and created a lot of features uh, built into our platform to kind of solve and address. Uh, what happened was that uh, we were actually demoing uh, our product uh, to some of the biggest uh, analysts um, on the market. Uh, and like they, they kind of looked at the demo and said, you know, why aren't you, you know, we're starting a new category, which is uh, marketplaces. Uh, why aren't you participating in that? You're kind of outperforming already in these demos with a lot of features that we're seeing lacking in the uh, marketplace industry right now in software. So um, why won't you participate in that too? Uh, and we did, and we scored pretty high. So uh, again, using all the built-in features that we already were solving for what we were considering uh, standard use cases for B2B, also kind of almost um, as a side effect, created uh, a whole new product, which is Marketplace. So we had already vendor management. We had a lot of these kind of uh, tools that and features that are needed uh, for the Marketplace. Plus, we brought a lot more flexibility than other platforms in terms of the different business models that we see for Marketplaces, because uh, we could have not only just uh, listing all items uh, in one place and just allowing the vendors, uh, different vendors to kind of log in and manage that. But we also could solve for um, uh, use cases where every seller gets his own website built on, uh, on our platform. So a different kind of a little bit of model for marketplaces. Uh, so if you think about the Amazon marketplace versus um, a marketplace that's virtual where uh, you do go to a separate website for every seller, but it's still managed by a single entity on the back end. So again, we are able to solve with our platform so much uh, of the use case for marketplaces that we decided to, with the analyst's recommendation, to actually market it as such and start addressing this market directly. Uh, so you know, even though uh, we, a lot of us are technologists, this was almost like a business and slash marketing decision, to be honest. Uh, just as I said, as a side product for what we already created for the B2B e-commerce and digital commerce uh, space already. I love that. Um, and, the, and it is such a tribute to the flexibility of, of Oro uh, that, that it was so easily fit into that purpose. I'm, I'm curious what market shifts or what is happening in the market, Yoav, that you feel like is driving this uh, you know, need for B2B companies to have marketplace, uh, to marketplaces. Like, is it, is it technology evolution? Is it business needs? What, like, what are you seeing that's the driving this? Uh, so, so there's different aspects that we're seeing right now that are kind of making this decision. First of all, uh, the old uh, uh, use case where my competitor is doing it, I should do it as well. So we see a lot of this kind of, uh, I have to start rushing to the, to the playground and kind of match and uh, be competitive. Uh, we see a lot of this today and um, because marketplaces are becoming a, a hot trend right now. Uh, but I would add that uh, we are seeing um, that a lot of B2B 
companies um, because of just the way they, they do business, right? They might be the, the central uh, point of contact to a customer, but in the back end of that, there's a lot of other vendors. Um, and for many orders, there can be you know five, 10 vendors involved in a single order, even if I'm selling it directly to a customer. So we're seeing that those relationships already exist on the business side a lot of times. And a lot of times there's uh, the use case for just bringing direct contact between the, the buyer and one of the vendors that I work with. Um, and that opt you know makes it more optimal for um, and efficient to to have them interact directly sometimes without the needs of my sales team to get interacted uh, in the middle and kind of facilitate that communication. We see that. Uh, we also see that there's a lot of B2B companies that um, maybe they provide the products or sell the finished goods, uh, but there's a lot of services around that. Uh, for example, installation, implementation, configuration, whatever that industry um, uh, needs. Um, and then allowing to uh, have one place where the customer kind of interacts with the brand that's selling their devices that they're buying or machinery or goods, um, and then put them inside like uh, Rodrigo is calling it a community of um, SIs or um, kind of uh, uh, service providers around the software, around the products that they're creating. So we're really seeing this kind of multiple use cases, what's driving uh, the kind of the larger company, the larger seller to kind of uh, bring around and kind of allow some of the vendors that they're working with to have direct contact to their, to their customers. Now, that said, we also see models where the backend vendors are not exposed, but that is a way for them to, to allow the seller themselves to kind of grow their catalog, right? So let's say if I manufacture 5,000 products and, and can sell them by uh, bringing on vendors that can do dropship now and B2B and stuff like that, stuff that we haven't seen traditionally done, uh, but in a single interaction, meaning that me as a customer, I might be even oblivious that I'm actually ordering from multiple vendors and that's actually done on the back end. Now we still treat that as marketplace because a lot of times we still need the vendor management. The, there's all the order processing, splitting the order to the different vendors on the back end. But sometimes the customer won't even know that he's interacting or buying off the marketplace, right? So we're seeing a lot of these evolutions in B2B. I think a lot of this comes um, from what we're seeing on the market. There's a lot of market consolidation. There's a lot of uh, 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 attempts to cut costs and be more efficient, uh, reach more customers. Um, so we're seeing a lot of drivers that are from the business side, but now technology is there to serve them. So they can actually do this in a, in a, in a more simplified and efficient way, rather than having a lot of mess where a lot of phone calls are happening in the background and the fax machines are still involved, et cetera. We are providing them today uh, as technology, not only order, but in general sense, uh, technology is providing them an efficient way to actually build these processes, automate a lot of it, and make it a, an efficient way for the buyers to interact with less uh, vendors for a single order. So um, I'll say those are a lot of the drivers. I, I would say I, I do, I know I'm probably babbling here a little, little bit, but I do want to add one interesting use case that we've seen, and I can, of course cannot mention the name, but this is one of the biggest uh, uh, energy kind of uh, companies, uh, and, and they were in the uh, alternative energy kind of space uh, as well, one of their departments, and um, they actually created this marketplace um, to actually learn about the competitors. And, and if you look at some of these kind of uh, alternative energy farms, they might have might use different brands uh, for all their turbines and uh, generators and whatnot, but by creating a marketplace for all the spare parts, regardless of the brand uh, that they're using, even if it's a competitor brand, um, it was a data play because that allowed the actual manufacturer to learn how those uh, energy farms are actually being used, uh, what uh, you know, uh, get some of the stats on the on the competitors' uh, products, etc. So we've seen that data play used for uh, as a reason to have actually a marketplace created. So again, just putting that out, the, the, there's a lot of different drivers why we are seeing businesses going into the space, uh, but it's definitely something that we're seeing as a growing trend, and we're seeing the amount of requests growing. We're seeing more and more uh, companies that are interested to kind of uh, start understanding what marketplace means to them and how they can change their business model. I, this is just fascinating. I, if I were going to distill some of that down, Yoav, like I'm, what I'm hearing is one a strategy for growth. Like, how do we offer more than our existing catalog? How do we offer more than what we can provide customers? I'm also hearing this idea that like the market is trending that way. You see companies that are really um, uh, starting to see really successful business models. 
I also heard about, you know, customer experience and creating and, and even like through a lot of different use cases, whether it's services, whether it's additional products, whether it's trying to be a one-stop shop, really providing a better customer experience is, is a huge part of this for, for what you're seeing in the market. Just, just uh, uh, you know, again, creating like this better customer experience uh, yeah, and, uh... and, and, and making yourself more relevant. Yeah, absolutely, and and keeping your customers um, uh, around because if they start looking around uh, other places, then you might lose them. Now, there are more and more businesses like uh, parts space that are coming and providing the service because the specific industry lacks this kind of uh, place where you can consolidate all these different uh, vendors and then in the efficient way you can basically buy and shop. So of course, Rodrigo's business model is is something that we're also seeing uh, growing, but. We're also seeing a lot of manufacturers and distributors actually dabbling now in uh, marketplaces. One of, one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if I may add something to what uh, Yo just 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 mentioned, um, just just to round it up and 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 to your point, like make it very specific to aviation aerospace. That what this is part of my personal view, but again, it's, this is what we're seeing in the industry as well. Is that you think of that marketplaces are the almost the a byproduct of part of the evolution of the democratization of information in the sense that for, for, for the B2B uh, space, in the sense that a marketplace ideally should be a, a neutral, unbiased party, if you will. I just I just give you the digital platform where a particular any given seller, right, in that industry can go in and have a, a higher degree of confidence when they are searching and comparing potentially thousands of products in and providers based on industry specific data. That's for instance, something that even if uh, as much as I love Google and some of the searching capabilities and when you're comparing products, this, I, I know this is more applicable to, to the B2C market, uh, but, but in the B2B market uh, uh, in, 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 in our space, whenever you go and buy a part, well, being able to see, identify what is the demand, what are the average, uh, pricing, right? And in our case, it's specific in aviation. I know it's a similar case for other industries as well. When you, when you, when you go to the B2Cs, normally you're buying new things. So the price is just MSRP or whatever it make it, but you only have one. It's, it's a more linear equation. In our industry, you can have multiple condition codes. So depending on the condition code of the part, the pricing might be drastically different, right? So, so a marketplace, if, 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 it, if it's able to provide the seller all that information is, is again a higher a higher confidence that yeah this is the right part this is the right uh, provider for it as you know in our case because of the criticality that that these parts play in our in our customers uh, business as well I, I want to make sure that for instance who is this seller right what are what are some of the additional data points associated to that part that yeah I I, I can buy it, especially with a lot of the uh, and again that that would be probably a, a, a conversation for for a, for, a, for a different time. But COVID, um, specifically in aviation aerospace, has forced uh, from the larger operators to um, repair stations to rethink how they do business, right? So having all of this aggregated industry-specific information as part of the purchase process when you go into the marketplace and say, yeah, this is the part for me, it's crucial for us, right? That's, that's, that's one of the huge differentiators that we have with any other company out there because Amazon, they may have, for instance, at one point, they could have all the sellers that we have, which again, I'm exaggerating, but the industry data that we've collected over 25 years, that it's available to our members, right? Every time that they search for a part, there's, there's no one else that can provide that, that level of, of uh, detail around, uh, again, supply, demand, market pricing information. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I I, I want to move to the next question, but I want to anchor in something as we go through this. That is that is this idea of customer experience um, and creating a better customer experience because you both kind of touched on it through this this process, and um, I am seeing especially. Um, you know, as we got into 2020 and the pandemic, there was just this acceleration of, of creating a better customer experience. And, and, you know, I, I, I now work on the, the enterprise WordPress, uh, side of the, the, the world. And, and we're seeing this, uh, 
this same thing that Yoav's talking about, which is this idea that the world is really trying to create a better digital experience and rapidly. And so how do you do that? Um, you know, how do you how do you take um, you know, five, 10 years of innovation that you want to have as a business and really create that in a year or a year and a half and, and do that really quickly and effectively as, as you move forward. Um, which is really interesting, just this idea of, of not only having it be for growth, but also for customer experience, which um, I really like that you all both touched on. What, as you get into some of the practical things about launching a marketplace, what are some of the must do things that that folks have to do? Like what what are some things that that folks have to have to get right before they launch a marketplace? Um well, you know, uh, if you want to go first. Oh, no, go oh, first. thank you. Well, uh, I I know that this may sound elementary, uh, Jari, but uh knowing your your customer, I think that's 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 the key element. And as I said, it's it, it may sound like, well, yeah, that's 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 obvious, but I guess the, the reason why I bring it up is because in the in the B2C arena, well, depending on the industry that you're playing, you may be able to have a, 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 a very clear definition, fairly, you, you might be able to arrive to a, to a clear definition of who your, your uh, prospect buyer is going to be, right? Uh, but in the B2B space is, is very different because the buyer personas that you're potentially catering to might be very diverse based on geographical location based on industry class within your vertical. And the other thing is that you need your customer both in terms of buyers and suppliers, right? Because of, for a marketplace to be successful, you need to have a healthy amount of both, right? So to me, that's one of the key things that you need to size up, not, not, not only in terms of market share, uh, the, the, the perspective revenue, but again, knowing those, those different uh, personas, the the sub, the industry classes that they play within within your industry, uh, I think that that's 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 huge. That, that would be one of the key things for sure. Yeah. So uh, uh, now, go ahead, uh, Yeah, please. I think uh, I think um, Rodrigo's points are very very valid. I, I'll just bring what we are kind of uh, talking to some uh, customers. So again, Rodrigo's business has been in the marketplace kind of business and uh, business model for a long time. But uh, I'll state something, that, and I know I'm the technologist uh, was invited as the technologist to this, but I would I would point out that one of the biggest things when we're talking to companies that don't have experience in um, in uh, marketplaces is actually understand first and foremost their their business model and what they're expecting that to be because uh, we really see that a lot of uh, companies you know come to us and say well we want a marketplace and then when we start getting into kind of the the features that we need to build for them we're seeing that they are lacking kind of the real vision of the business model around it and, and just understanding what the type of interaction is between them and the different sellers them and the different customers uh, and that goes even then uh, to, to other places where you need to kind of uh, understand who's the uh, uh, who's going to handle customer support who you know things that a lot of companies don't even put on their kind of uh, list of things to do for marketplace because everybody's like, oh, marketplace I just allow everybody to list everything and and you know we get something from it. But I think there's a lot more to do around it, and especially if you're new to it. So like if you're a manufacturer or a distributor and saying, you know, I want to now start offering kind of a marketplace features. Uh, or availability to my customers, uh, understand that there's a lot of business decisions that need to be done there because we see that, like I said, when we start projects, when we start uh, working on specs with companies that are new to this, there's a lot of open issues that they have to figure out on the business side before we get to the technology and product side. So uh, just pointing that out and adding it to kind of, if, you, if you're considering it, if you're new to this, there's a lot of things to learn about the business model behind the marketplace. I love that. Another... Oh, go ahead, yeah. Please. No, and another thing that I was I was thinking as, as I was listening to you all is yeah it's it's I mean there there are so many different things right but another element that I believe just, just thinking in terms of, of the business side of the, the business model side of things is I think a, a huge component of of uh, or a huge part of what what you need to do is have a comprehensive well defined outreach strategy that you're going to have to bring in those people like both like it could be suppliers in in buyers to your marketplace. And, you know, when I say outreach strategy, I mean, that's, again, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a topic in itself, but it includes, you know, your SEO, your PPC, email campaigns, trade show presence, and um, how are you going to do that? In fact, 
going back to the previous question for a second, uh, one of the one of the advantages that you get uh, of participating in a marketplace and why they are such a hot trend is because it provides, uh, well, in this case for for sellers, is the benefits of economies of scale. You know, so so when a marketplace is already positioned, well, just in terms of the 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 organic reach that you're going to get to potential buyers of your product, right? So if you're considering doing that on your own, it's doable, right? And there are ways that without having to spend like millions of dollars with PPC, uh, with, with Google, you can do it. But it's important that as part of your business model and how you're going to be attracting people that you have a very well, like uh, at least outlined, like uh, outreach strategy. Right? And how, how are you going to get people into that marketplace? Yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot about the business elements of, of creating a marketplace, which I so value you all's perspective because I think you both are, uh, definitely have come up through the technology organization, but have a deep amount of empathy for the business case and the use case and the customer, which is 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 actually really interesting to hear sort of both sides of your both of your minds work. I want to dump jump into the technical side really quick. Um, you know, we we may have some CTOs listening, some folks that are from the you know uh, leading the technology side of this. What's the biggest challenge that you faced? Um, and maybe Rodrigo, I'll start with you. What's the biggest challenge that you faced um, building a, a, a marketplace at, at parts base? And, and then um, as you talk about that, Yoav, just maybe be thinking about, you know, are you seeing this something similar at other customers? Um, you know, or is this thematic across um, what you're seeing, you know, with other companies trying to build a, a marketplace? But uh, Rodrigo, I'd love to hear your perspective on that just from a CTO perspective. For sure. Thank you, Jerry. Um, well, the first thing, probably the biggest top to mind is adoption. You know, the, 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 in terms of the challenges is, and when I say adoption from a from a technology perspective is, um, and this is this is uh, even if if you think of, of of our core locator service, right? So I want as many sellers, uh, suppliers, advertising uh, their 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 products in our marketplace. So. I need to give them the ability to easily connect to our platform, right? So we have a public API that uh, everybody is is capable of using, but uh, because of the nature of our industry, in many cases, uh, we're not as standardized or uh, we're not as sophisticated as other verticals, for instance, like healthcare, financial services. So it is a challenge to build a, like a one size fits all, if you will, uh, model for for the intake of um, inventories and, and capabilities are going to be listed in our platform. It's a similar challenge that we're facing on the now that we're moving into the full transactional model with with the marketplace. Uh, the good news is that with the Oro marketplace, we have a very robust API that we can rely on. But still, is working with our customers, uh, defining those. Uh, generic adapters that are going to help them ultimately to be able to effectively list all their inventories right in 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 the in the marketplace. And when I say it's not only the inventory, right, is another challenge that we have is that in many cases our suppliers they have uh, different systems that are not necessarily talking to each other. I'm sure that some people in the audience that might sound familiar. So bringing in, because when you're talking about marketplaces, well, obviously I need the part number information. I need some, but I need, I need all these other ancillary elements related to the part so I can effectively advertise it, uh, um, sell it online. So that is, that is probably uh, one of the biggest challenges and, and kind of a byproduct of that is um, sometimes the information coming from our suppliers, sellers is not perfect. So how I, rationalize it, right? So, oh, if I see that, you know, this part is not conforming with X, Y, Z, wh what do I do with it, right? Because in many cases, you have to rely on on the seller uh, for the correct information, uh, the, the accuracy of, of, of the information included as part of the part description. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, po the, the point that I'm trying to make is, yeah, building that universal interface, and then how do I help my sellers to make sure that they provide as much information as they can Right. And whenever there are deviations from what we would normally expect, how we can rationalize all of those. So going back to your comment in terms of the user experience, how can I provide my buyers now a, a very seamless, the best experience possible when trying to look at a part, compare between different sellers? 
Yeah, and I think uh, if I can jump in on this a bit, um, yeah, definitely. Um, because the points are the one thing that we actually um, face a lot. And, and like I said, us being a platform, we many times um, interact with companies that this is their first go at being a marketplace, right? So I think we always see um, maybe a lower even starting point than where Rodrigo's uh, and Parts Base is today uh, and their maturity in this space, right? So they they really f know this, but, but Rodrigo's points are really the biggest points that we're seeing is that there's... Um, a huge problem in many, many industries to kind of standardize the catalog, uh, standardize the content, uh, make sure that the product is really identified across the board, across different sellers, across uh, your catalog, your uh, ERP system, et cetera. So I think that was always going to be and will be uh, a challenge. I, I don't know. There was many attempts in the technology world to kind of standardize all the world's catalogs and all that. Uh, yet to see that happen. I've been around, you know, for for about 20 years in e-commerce and, and we've always heard this uh, kind of uh, attempt to do that, but that doesn't exist. So definitely one of the hardest points is to kind of understand how your industry's uh, products are being um, referred to, uh, called, how you can kind of um, link them and understand which product is which. Then, of course, enriching the content, uh, the because again, especially in B2B, a lot of content is so basic and so uh, uh, non-descriptive and no imagery, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of lack in the terms of content. So we see that as a huge uh, problem. Um, uh, and I'll say, again, to Rodrigo's point, this the the next big point for us is integration to existing systems. And now you're enhancing that problem because now you might have to integrate uh, to third party and sellers kind of systems if they're big enough and they demand from you uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of integration to their systems, right? So again, if you're working with a lot of smaller ones, you might tell them this is how we work uh, and you do the work, you can decide to use our APIs or flat files or something. But when we always bring like bigger sellers into our marketplace, uh, they might demand uh, integration to their systems. So again, choosing a platform that's flexible enough allows you to kind of uh, integrate to multiple technologies, different systems, et cetera, I think is, uh, is something that needs to be a key for that. Um, and then just, again, rounding it up is the customer experience, right? So how do you create this, this unified customer experience in the catalog, um, but then also for the checkout and interaction with the different sellers? So I'll say those are all things that uh, new companies that are trying to get into B2B have to kind of uh, focus on. I think those are the biggest uh, pitfalls. Again, there's many others, but those are ones that you have to figure out. Can I standardize the catalog? Can I integrate uh, to all the systems that I will need to integrate? And then how do I build the customer experience that is kind of seamless and, and building value for them to use my marketplace rather than going direct to the sellers? I love that. I really, really like the flexibility um, elements that you're talking about, which is, is so critical, especially as you have like big B2B companies that are working together. How do you, how do you integrate uh, in a way that, that isn't, you know, that is seamless? I, I, this kind of goes into one of the questions I wanted to ask Rodrigo is, you know, you're hearing you all talk about some of the, the you know, uh, things that customers really need. What have been some of the competitive advantages that you all have created against your competition um, in this marketplace? Or what are some of the features and capabilities that you feel like put you way ahead of the competition uh, that you, you've adopted? Thank you, Jari. Uh, yeah, well, um, maybe it's wrong for me to say it, but I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've been in, I've been in technology for, for over 20 years. And I, I, I think it's, there's some merit, if you will, to what I'm about to say is, um, I think that the first and foremost is the technology behind our solution. Uh, it's uh, on the on the locator side of, of of the business. I think that's a huge part of our um, recipe for success because we continue uh, investing, uh, adding adding features and functionality that a uh, are being re um, requested by our customers, and obviously it's also part of us just watching, observing how the different uh, uh, types of users use the platform and make sure that we cater to to their needs. Uh, and now combining the, the power, if you will, of our native platform with all the features and capability, going back to the technology element that, um, that Oro brings to the table, I think that's probably one of our, our biggest uh, competitive advantages compared to any other marketplace solution out there. Uh, the, other, the other huge differentiator, as I mentioned before, is the amount of industry-specific information that is available uh, to the buyer's fingertips the minute that they search and want to buy a part 
marketplace, they can easily see uh, different elements, as I mentioned, supply and demand, uh, uh, average price points uh, from, from market uh, perspective, um, and get catering to the different use cases. For instance, when an airline comes and buy a part, well, they may look at different data points versus um, a regional operator or you know, the, the, the different, a different type of user for the platform. So being able to cater to those different buyer personas, I think that's another big differentiator for us. Um, so th those are probably some of the, the key things that I, that I would highlight uh, in terms of what we have right now. Uh, one of the things that thinking about the future, this is not, uh, th this, is, uh, this is something that we're uh, gonna be including uh, early next year is in our case, again, this is, this is very specific to the aviation aerospace industry. We have this particular use case called AOG, right? So aircraft on the ground. So when an when our aircraft is down, like for maintenance and it was scheduled to fly, whatever, as you can imagine, and they need the part yesterday, right? So in some cases, they might even fly out someone just to whatever they can buy the part, right? And bring it to where the aircraft is so it can be, um, uh, it, it's back on, on, on circulation. So uh, as part of our marketplace solution, we're going to be incorporating this additional capability. So whenever you're buying a part, uh, as you go through the checkout process, you're going to be able to see in terms of the different shipping options that are available is not only the cost, but we're going to give you all these uh, um, different options for you to select the, uh, again, not only pricing, but the reliability and, and in terms of how quickly the, the, the we're gonna rank those shipping options based on uh, the reliability and how, how quickly the part can be delivered to you. So it goes back to that whole uh, seamless user experience that caters to the specific needs that uh, are, are applicable to our industry, which goes back to yeah, being very industry specific and all those yeah. ancillary, ancillary elements that you all was was referring to earlier. Yeah, you guys are you're both talking about the same thing, which is leaning on this theme for me of flexibility and customization. Um, you know, if you're a B two C e commerce company, it, you may not need a lot of flexibility and customization. If you're selling hats, it may be the same thing as t shirts, maybe the same thing as pants. But if we're talking about this, you know. Your world, Rodrigo, is so custom and unique and has so many unique intricacies. You know, it really goes back to what I'm hearing you anchor in is this need for flexibility and uniqueness and a, and a, and a technology that really has empathy for the uniqueness um, uh, that you have as a business and will adapt to, um, from a flexibility standpoint, will adapt to the, the, the technology needs that you have, which maps into exactly what Yoav was talking about with the Gartner conversations with, um, with uh, the, the need that companies have for unique flexibility, unique integrations, um, no two businesses being the same in this. Um, and I think a lot of companies feel almost, you know, this is just my own perspective on this, but I think a lot of companies feel this intimidation, like, well, you know, do we build something from scratch because we have such a unique need, right? Like, or do we like no off the shelf technology is really going to work for us. And, you know, what I'm hearing you both say is, is if you find a technology that's, that's approachable enough or modular or customizable enough, you can really work on that as a platform for the integration and, and the customization that you need, which is, which is exactly what's made you successful in this Rodrigo. I, I, so I, the one, ask, one last thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. If I, if I may, adding to what you just said is, I think we where technology is today, and forget about technology. I mean, the, the world as as a whole is is. I don't think there will be a use case out there for you to justify the investment of building the marketplace technology on your own. I mean, I may yeah. be wrong. Maybe maybe if you're a huge man, you maybe. But given given the state of technology, and because by the time that you get there, a your marketplace is going to be obsolete, and the millions and billions of dollars that you've invested is now. And that's why you have to let companies like Aro and that that that's that's what they do, right? So and besides, is is if the, the other thing that I would say to that point is that if you want a product that is going to fit 100% of your use case, your your your, your assessment is incorrect. You got to go for the 70, 75, 80, 20. You know, so there is no product out there that's going to be able to cater to everything that you need. So as long as you said, as, as you look for a product that gives you that 
uh, modular approach and that gives you speed to market in terms of ability to develop or, or extend existing features. And again, that it caters to the 80% of your use case and the 20% or 25% of the case you build based on the building blocks that the solution gives you. That's why you need to do. Again, if you're approaching it from the other, you're, you're, you're missing it because by the time you get there, you're already extinct. My, my humble opinion. It's, it's amazing, Rodrigo. Every time we have a customer uh, in the market come on and talk, there's always like one or two comments that are like, the money comments, right? Like it's like the whole reason that we do the podcast is for these like one or two comments. And and that was like, that was such a profound comment that you just made. And I think something that so many folks need to hear, especially if they're, you know, considering building their own marketplace or, or on the other end of it, uh, which is, you know, we need something that has everything that we're looking for, right? You're just not going to, you're not going to find that. So it's that 80, 80, 20 rule. I, I want to, we're just about at time here. I want to give Yoav, both you and Rodrigo, the, the time to give some final thoughts. For, for companies, businesses that are thinking about adopting a B2B market business, a B2B business marketplace business model, what would you recommend? And, and Yoav, you probably, I mean, what, with what Rodrigo just said, which, which I believe is really, really impactful and profound, what would you add to that or or um, say about t two companies thinking about this business model? Well, I would probably say that, um, again, really, really figuring out what's the added value that they're bringing with this marketplace in their industry. Um, definitely, again, like we discussed, or of course, have a kind of at least clear uh, go-to-market uh, business model and how you're gonna entice your, both your customers and your vendors to actually join this. But I'll say from the technology side, really choose uh, a product that works for you. Um, you know, I always say in the IT world, it's a pendulum, right? We go between uh, do it on your own and uh, off the shelf, one size fit all, right? And we kind of moving between those two extremes. Um, it's never um, good to be on any one of these sides. Just choose something that really allows you to be fast to market. All that, like Rodrigo said, I, you know, like you said, this is <laughs> Rodrigo summed up everything that we probably want people to hear here. Uh, but I, I do say, I, I do think that this is not only a technology project, right? So again, I, as much as we're a technologist, I'm going to bring that back. Make sure the business is, um, underst is understood, that the business is uh, also signed in and, and committed to, to doing this uh, and providing uh, a clear kind of understanding of the steps that need to be taken. Again, working with a mature company like Rodrigo's and Partsbase, it was easy for us, right? Because they knew what they need and we told them how we're going to do that. Um, and what needs to be built and what's available out of the box. But when, when you are new to this, definitely you need to have this understanding, sign off and sign in from uh, all participants and clear understanding what the technology needs to do. I would also add uh, for what kind of Rodrigo kind of alluded to this, but this is very, very important, is to not buy too much at once, especially if it's a new kind of uh, business um, uh, a business channel for your, or a channel for your business, sorry. Um, really try to go in a kind of... Um, iterations and 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 work on it May, see what's successful and leave it or continue on that path and then add more and more but kind of have the mvp right what's what's going to bring you to market what's going to start proving this kind of business model for you before you spend years and years developing something really do this iterative kind of model um chew off like one bite at a time uh, add that make sure that's successful and then continue adding because sometimes we get lists like rfps with like thousands of thousands of lighted items and RFPs. And we look at it and it's like, there's no way this is gonna be done in three to four or five years even, right? Uh, just from the scope and, and what needs to be done on the company side. So we really tell, let's choose the MVP. Let's prove this model in your industry. Let's see if that actually works and then improve on that. Get feedback, real feedback from real customers, real vendors that are gonna use your marketplace and, and improve on that rather than guessing and going to market the, you know, after a few years and then like Rodrigo said, by most, most times you're going to be obsolete and, and not relevant by the time you launch it. So be fast to market with the, what features you think is going to change the industry, help the industry make more customers and vendors uh, join the marketplace um, and then continue evolving from there. The I other think thing, uh, uh, if, I may, a, if I may oh, add okay. one last thing to what yeah. you all just, just mentioned is, yeah, even, even for a company as, as mature as we are in, in our industry, when we decided to kind of move forward, if you will, uh, uh, with the first, with obviously what, what I would humbly call like our POC into e-commerce, 
even when we had all of this information, historical information in terms of our customers do business, we, we as, as, as you all said, we wanted to start small, right? We wanted to provide, be quick to market, provide a, what I would call a basic user experience that would allow us to validate some of those uh, hypotheses, if you will, that we have in terms of how people were going to use it. And, and again, to your point, once we start getting the feedback, in some cases, you said, yeah, it's right that uh, it was good that we did it this way. In some cases, we said, it's good that we didn't spend that much money in X, Y, Z, because guess what? People were going to use it differently anyway, right? So it's important that you take a, an incremental approach. Um, so A, you are relevant and you can quickly test what works and what doesn't, right? Even now that we're about to, to launch the next iteration or the full, like, 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 the, like all, the, all the features that come with the uh, parts based oral marketplace, we're going with MVP, right? So that doesn't contain everything that we want, right? Because again, we want to test it. We want to, add, again, this, this could be probably a conversation for, for another podcast, right? So there are technologies like DAP that can help you understand how people are using the product, right? So if you put that on top of any type of product that you have, but especially in a marketplace, and again, if you're able to segregate on your different users, there, there, that, is, that is worth gold because you will truly understand how people use your marketplace. And then based on that, that's how you grow. Right. Otherwise, you may be spending, again, millions of dollars on something that oh, only 10 percent of people uh, uh, use. But then you have this other feature that you spend nothing and then everybody's using it. So the, the, the point is that you want to be incremental, you, you, the, even if you get the, That's why I, I, I use this as an example, even as, as with all the years of experience that we have, it was important to take an incremental approach, because as much as you know, the more you know, I guess the more you understand that there's so much more that you need to learn. I love the theme. I'll, I'll remind you, Rodrigo, next time. Yeah, time. yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll say I'll remind your word, you your, your own words uh, next time we meet and uh, plan for next year. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, it, it's 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 really, I think, um, on, the, on the building the product side, I think that is the, the key, right? Is not to choose something too big at once and, and really learn what works for your business, for your industry, for your marketplace and, and build on those and then add features as you see the need for and not just because you think it's great uh, things to add. So again, um, hearing it from Rodrigo and this is this is really, I, I guess your second money uh, line right here is like, uh, yeah, be incremental, be um, iterative about the development. I think that definitely would be important for your success uh, in the future. It's, it's amazing how much alignment there is between the things that the two of you are saying. And you're, you're both, like, as we, I ask these questions, you're both really saying the same things just with these two, sort of two unique viewpoints. Yo, of you as the, the software creator and, and Rodrigo, you as the, the executive sort of consumer and sponsor of, of adopting these technologies. The themes that I think are so powerful that have come out of this um, that I really want to distill down in, in what we share out to the market is um, one, this idea, start small, start incremental, this, you know, get something out into market and take the feedback from your customers, heard that loud and clear. Um, two, know the use case, know, know your why. You know, you both kind of talked about this in, in you know, in certain ways. Are you trying to create a better customer experience? Are you trying to create more products for, for um, uh, your customers to buy? Are you trying to create a, a more of a destination, more brand presence? Like you, you both really talked about this idea of, of really sort of like being understanding your why, which everybody has a different in terms of like why they start a marketplace. And then also being appreciating, I, I heard this balance of like appreciating that you have customization and complete uniqueness to your business model, but also not being afraid to choose a, a technology product that that will allow you flexibility in that um, and, and understanding towards your business model. I think these were, um, this is just, these are fantastic tips. I really appreciate the time. We, none of this is scripted for the audience. None of this is scripted. We, we um, have an idea of some of the questions we may talk about, but, but none of this is ever scripted. So um, I just so appreciate um, both you, Rodrigo, and, and Yoav sharing your wisdom uh, with us in this format. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're going to keep this on, on LinkedIn. Um, we'll be sharing the recording. Uh, we just look at this as the start of the engagement with us. So 
Uh, Anna, thank you so much for organizing. She's our producer. She does an incredible job. So thank you for getting us all set up. And uh, Yoav and Rodrigo, thank you so much. Everybody, have a great day. Thank you both. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.